Folks, I'd like you to consider the following statement. And as you do, I'd like you to pause for a minute and think about what this absolutely means about what an object does. Pause, think, unpause when you're ready. Go ahead. Okay, what it means is, by definition, that an object accelerates at a constant rate. All right? Now, uh, accelerates, that comes from this part. At a constant rate comes from this part. Fair enough? Okay, now, let's add to that the following. The object doesn't, however, speed up or slow down. And this is possible. I know the thinking, right? Acceleration means speed up or slow down, but it doesn't have to. An object can accelerate at a constant rate even if it doesn't speed up or slow down. So pause for a minute again. Think about what this must mean. Go ahead and pause. Okay, welcome back. What it means is that the object must change direction. Did you get it? Change direction. Here's an important part too. At a constant rate. Fair enough? Okay. So what does that mean? Uh, it might be the, well, there are two ways to go about this, but let's talk about what this would, uh, how do we do this? How do you apply an unbalanced force to an object but not have it speed up. All right. Well, let's look at a let's look at forces um, in a few different orientations. All right. Here's one. If we use that force and push on that object with that force. Well, here's what happens. Now, first of all, this vector here is a velocity, not a not a force. It indicates the direction this object is currently moving. If we were to push like this on this object, it would speed up. No doubt about it. If we were to push like this, the object would slow down. If we were to push well, like this, the object would still speed up because there's a component of this force that goes that way. All right? If we were to push like this, the object would slow down because there's a component of this force that pushes that way. So what we can't have is any component of this force that pushes either in the direction of motion or opposite. Not even one little component. So how do you do it? Well, you do it like this. If we were to apply a force like that word, like, like that word, like that, there's no component of that force that pushes in the direction the object is moving, at that instant at least. All right, that would not change its speed. What might happen is that the object, whoops, the object might now at some later time end up like over here. All right, it was going this way, so it ends up farther to your right, but it's being pushed down where it ends up farther down. But the deal is now it will be moving, you know, in a direction like that, let's say. Okay? Fair enough. All right, well, what if we apply this same force? Right, this same force. If we keep pushing downward, well, now there is a component of that force in the direction of motion. This thing would speed up. All right, so what we have to do is keep this force perpendicular to the object's motion, All right? And so now we can do this, group, 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 and now say the object ends up uh, down here, but now it's moving like that way, All right? And then it ends up, say, like down here, but well, now it's moving like this way, all right? And then it ends up like down here, but now it's moving like, uh, like, whoops, like, like that way. Whoops, like down here, yeah, yeah. 
it's hard to draw. So if you're having trouble drawing this, don't don't worry about it. We'll we'll iron out the what we need to draw in a minute. But what you notice is that as long as we keep the force that we're applying to this thing, the net force perpendicular to the object's velocity, the object will never change speed. It can't. All right. And the result of that, of always doing that, well, you notice that the path literally does that. And the path ends up being a circle. All right. And that works again if you go back to here and say, oh, yeah, change direction at a constant rate. Yep, that sounds like what would happen if you moved in a circle. Every second, your direction changes by X number of degrees. Okay? So what we're talking about in this new investigation is circular motion. Okay? Now, a few things we have to be uh, totally sure of. One, at any instant, and let's assume for an instant this, this is an object moving in a counter, or sorry, in a clockwise circle. At any instant, Let's talk about the direction that the object is moving. So, for example, at this instant, you should be able to draw, ideally, draw a vector that describes or shows the direction this object moves. You should pause a minute, think about that, and see what you come up with. Pause. Okay, you're back. All right. At this instant, the object is moving in that direction. That's a straight line vector. It's not a curve. Okay. It is in that direction. At this instant, it's moving in that direction. At this instant, it's moving in that direction. These are all velocity vectors, instantaneous velocities. All right. So in general, what direction is that object moving? It's moving tangent to the circle. Sometimes you'll hear this called a tangential velocity. Tangential. All right. Now, how fast does it go? Well, what we can't talk about is average velocity because you start here, end up back here. Your delta x is zero, and your average velocity going around a whole circle is actually zero. But let's talk about the speed this thing moves at. Well, we know speed is distance over time, right? Well, circular paths have a nice convenient distance to talk about, and it's circumference. And there's an amount of time that we can call a period, and a period that we use the variable capital T because it's a special amount of time. Time for one trip around a circle. One full trip. So we can write this uh, equation for speed. Yeah, I'm going to call it velocity but it's the magnitude of the velocity, instantaneous velocity, is uh, circumference, 2 pi r over the period. It's okay? Okay. Yeah. What direction does the object accelerate? Well, that might be a little easier if we actually talk about this one first, the next page. What's the direction of the net force? Well, we just said that. That's kind of how we open this thing. How do we apply a force to this thing without changing its speed? Well, we push this way. We push this way. That's the net force. Here's the net force. Here's the net force. So the direction of the net force is always... Ah, forget about always. Sure, always. The direction of the net force is toward toward the, the center. It's 
let's go back a slide. What that means by definition is that the acceleration is always toward the center. Now the thing about this is it looks like this is a non-constant acceleration, right? The, the, the magnitude of the acceleration might stay the same, but the direction keeps changing, right? It's going this way, and then this way, and then this way. And we want to say this is a constant acceleration. So what we do here is define a new direction. Well, that new direction is toward the center. And we call that the centripetal direction. So now we can say this acceleration actually does always point in the same direction. It always points towards the center. And we'll actually call that the positive centripetal direction. The negative centripetal direction is away from the center. All right? Now, how fast does the object accelerate? This is a little trickier, but I'll show you. All right? It starts here. I know there's a couple things written there. Let's look at an object's... Hey. Hey, let's look at an object's circular path and look at four different instants in time in that circular path. Okay. If we want to know or find acceleration, we want to talk about change in velocity per unit time, right? So, for example, in these first two instants, let's find the change in velocity. Well, that's V final minus V initial, or for us, V2 minus V1, right? Well, here's vector V2. Here's vector, well, really, vector negative V1, right? Here's vector V1. So this is vector negative V1, and I'm doing a tip-to-tail addition. So I'm doing V2 plus negative V1. Oh, yeah, same as V2 minus V1, right? And I wouldn't bother writing this down, folks. Okay? You'll notice you don't have this slide anyways. So, this vector is the resultant of those two. It's the delta V from instant one to instant two. Now, you can get the same vector if you do this a little bit odd. Take regular old vector V1, take regular old vector V2, but draw them tail to tail, and draw a vector from tip of one to tip of two, and these two vectors are the same vector, right, that delta V? So we can find all the delta Vs if we take all the vectors and draw them tail to tail and then connect those tips. Now, just like we said with our speed stuff, we don't want to talk about total change in position because it's actually zero, the vector. We don't want to talk about the total vector sum of these delta Vs. We want to talk about the magnitude of them so the total magnitude of the delta V is the perimeter of that square. Yeah? But the problem is there aren't just four velocities. There's really more like eight. There's really more like 16. There's really more like 32 or 64 or 1,000. Know, there's an infinite number of velocities. Right? And so if we want the total change in velocity, it's not just the perimeter of this square. It's the circumference of that circle. 2 pi r over, well, our time is that period. But remember, r does not refer to this actual radius of an actual circular path. r refers to the radius of this crazy circle, which is made up of velocity vectors. These are all velocity vectors. So the total change in velocity is 2 pi v. It's a weird pi. So there's the 2 pi over t part, and here's v. We said a couple slides ago, 2 pi r over t. So you simplify, you get that. Now if you notice, remember, v is 2 pi r over t. So this looks a lot like we just took v and squared it for pi squared. That would be actually r squared over t squared. Well, we only want 
one factor of r there, so I got to do this. Divide both sides by r. Okay, yeah. So acceleration, now we do have that expression. So acceleration can also be written as v squared over r. All right, so you can write it as a, and I'm going to start to write it as a c in the centripetal direction. It is either 4 pi squared r over t squared, or the more common way to do it is v squared over r. And that makes the magnitude of the net force hopefully pretty straightforward because you know that any net force is always ma. And we can say this and this. And so what we normally see this written as is m, well, a is v squared over r. That's the most common application or most common form of the circular motion um, net force statement. Okay? Now, what we're going to end up doing is talking about situations in which each of our five forces can be the centripetal force or can contribute to sent to a net centripetal force. All right? The nice thing is, even though we're saying, well, this looks like a, a new force, it's not a new force, it's just a new direction. It's still just these forces that will either, well, something, one of these has to point towards the center for objects that we currently are going to talk about moving in circles. You know, there's a, I got a tennis ball on a string that I swing around my head. Here's me. Here's the ball on a string. The ball does that. What force is it that's making this ball move in a circle? It's the tension force, right? So we would just literally say tension equals net FC equals MAC, right? Tension equals MV squared over R. All right? There are four out of these five work pretty nicely. One of them doesn't work nicely at all. But four out of the five work real nicely. Okay? Um, so you'll get some experience with those uh, as we move forward and as you work through some problems that are coming up. Okay? Okay, people. Adios.